Happy May the 4th, dear listeners. And for this day, guess what? We've cooked you a little surprise. A Star Wars episode. Yeah. Let's get this going. May the 4th be with you. Listening to How to Get Away with Shakespeare with Jane Fox and Gabriel Vega. Starting now. Episode 8, James. Did I call you James? You did. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Who's James, by the way? James is um a stranger. <laughs> a stranger who lives in my home, eats my food, plays with my dog, and yet I have no idea. His identity. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> episode eight, Jane. Tarzan and Jane. Um, oh, I haven't heard that joke <laughs> ever before in my life. <laughs> anyway, we feel funny today, so we're going to continue with that vibe. So, episode eight, Star Wars, The Revenge Star Wars. of the Sith. Um, yes. So, first thoughts, uh, anything? It was your first time watching it, right? It was my first time watching it. Um, we need to talk about something before we get into really the meat of the film, and that's um, the prequel meme. It's like a huge thing. Like it's apparently the movie, the movie trilogy that just keeps on giving with like the jokes. Um, and so before I'd even seen the movie, I knew all the like the ultimate power. <laughs> <laughs> like all of those so when they showed up i was like this can't be a real movie because i've already heard these jokes like and then like it's all over social media right now yeah and i feel like it's been a long time since the movie was released but it feels also like it was yesterday what do you i don't mean? feel like the the 2000s were such a long time in my mind but I feel like I didn't know the 80s. I, I didn't know the 70s. I, I didn't live in them. That's so true. I feel like, like that's a long time. But when you lived in it and years are going so fast, that's true. Yeah, you're like, true. oh, that was yesterday. No, it was actually 20 years ago. <laughs> 20? Wow. No, it wasn't 20 years ago. Anyway, I, it was just an example. I don't know how long it's been. It was in the 2000s. The 2000s are an odd era, and I can't wait to see what the children who were born then grow up to be. <laughs> Terrors, probably. Yeah, anyway. Um, so the first time I saw it, um, I saw it in the theaters, actually. It was one of the last films I saw with my grandmother um, before she passed away. And um, yeah, I brought my grandmother and my mother to the cinema they're not star wars fans they're they don't care about fantasy at all uh they like the real stuff as they say um and they didn't know what the hell was going on but it was still it's still a good memory in my mind that i i brought them to that movie um and i remember my my grandmother laughing at when Yo yoda was fighting in dark city she was like what the hell <laughs> like she was laughing at clowns or something like it was so funny to her i mean physical humor is sort of you know it's funny to everyone right yeah no but i mean she it was almost like um, like she was ridiculing it like oh, like well. because she didn't know that that genre at all and yet a lot of people still ridicule it who do know a lot about it, I guess. So Yeah. I, I feel like I didn't act this way, though, because I was still a kid. Mm -hmm. And it was a great movie for me as a kid. Right. And now I watch it. <laughs> I It was the first time that I watched it. It's, it's been a long time since I've watched it. But yesterday was the, the first time uh, after mm. a long time. And it was the first time I ever saw it. What do you think of it? Um... I feel like it had 
potential. That's <laughs> how I feel about it. The story itself isn't that badly constructed, I think. No. But structure wise it's good. Yeah, and even not all the acting is bad. It's just strange. Wait, the acting's not bad. <laughs> said, not Excuse all me? the acting is yeah. not that bad. Yeah. A lot of it is bad. That's what uh, actually um, destroyed my childhood uh, yesterday because um, I found out that the acting was really bad for the first time. Um, and that was the, the, the worst part for me of that movie. I think the structure is great. I think... Uh, um, what about the writing? The writing is not good, <laughs> uh, especially in the beginning. I, I feel like it gets better as the movie progresses. Yeah. Um, and I feel the movie itself is gets better, not just the writing, as the movie progresses story-wise, structurally-wise, acting-wise, everything. Um, but, yeah, it was kind of <laughs> weird watching it but as an adult. You, have you heard the, the tragedy of Darth Plagueis, the wise? Yeah. It's not a story the Jedi would tell you. What do you mean? <laughs> that line, that's another prequel meme. Have you heard the tragedy of Darth Black? <laughs> <laughs> wow. I, did, I truly did not think that was a real line in the movie. It is. It was so badly written. And then I got to it and I was like, that's a real thing. That's a real thing. Yeah. Written by good old George Lucas himself. <laughs> what a guy. I mean, he created Star Wars. Um, I mean, it's like what I thought of when I, I think like George Lucas, George Lucas is clearly a genius creating such a, a, a big world, uh, from a, a little concept that he had. If you think about J.K. Rowling, who created a, a world, if you want to do that, uh, or, um, uh, I don't know who created another world, but J.R.R. Tolkien. But it's like a whole mythology, which is kind of... I could do that. You could do that? Yes. Okay. And Shakespeare definitely could. Why didn't Shakespeare write sci-fi? Do it and then uh, sell We know he's working books. on his, his Robocop. Yeah, but it's not so. original. I mean, he had an original idea, just like J.K. Rowling and just like uh, Token. That's what I mean. I'm, like creating another world. I'm not saying he didn't have a good idea. I'm just saying I don't think he's a genius. Okay. <laughs> Moving on. Tearing George Lucas apart. But apart clearly from. he lost his mind in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He lost his mind. I mean, he knows his Shakespeare very well. But apart from that, I'm sorry, but yeah. It's probably the best of the prequels, though. And the structure of the movie is probably good because it's from Shakespeare. Yeah. Enough negativity about Star Wars. Yeah, we're not here to be negative. Um, okay. Maybe I am. <laughs> well, blame it on Jane. Yeah. Anyway, today we're going to talk about the third movie of the prequel, the final prequel movie where we get to see Anakin Skywalker become Darth Vader. So, if you have not seen the prequels at that point, I'm sorry. Just go home. Jane has not seen them. Go home, Jane. I've seen Revenge of the Sith now. So, spoiler alert, yeah. Um, if you didn't know, Anakin Skywalker becomes Darth Vader. <laughs> I think that's pretty pop culture common knowledge. I didn't know that was going to happen. You didn't know. No, I'm kidding. Everyone knows that. I am your father. Yes. And it's no, I am your father, not Luke, I am your father. Excuse me. Oh, so what the hell does Shakespeare have to do with Star Wars and the Revenge of the Sith, Jane? Well, I mean, there are a lot of similarities to Othello. Yeah. Um, I think that's the main play that uh, George Lucas is writing from. Um, yeah, it's pretty much Othello, I think... Uh, um, Palpatine is very much Iago-like um, you can see the connection with uh, the way he manipulates Anakin um, we'll go into that deeper but uh, you can also see uh, with Padme and uh, Anakin um, killing her because he believes she's sleeping with Obi-Wan 
And Darth Sidious slash Palpatine is very much a Yago figure. He plays a game of manipulation, a game of twisting uh, things and planting thoughts into uh, Anakin's mind, just like Iago is planting thoughts into Othello's yeah. mind. Yeah, and doubt. Othello is acting upon them, um, from them. Um, exactly, yeah. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's the, in general, that's the connection to Othello. And now, everyone, welcome to Jane's special intermission. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash Shakespeare. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. For you, the listeners of the How to Get Away with Shakespeare podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. What I'm currently listening to is actually Persuasion by Jane Austen. They have a great um, collection of sort of the of the main novels, you know, Pride and Prejudice, Sense and Sensibility, and you get it all for one credit. And it's great because the narrator um, is actually very funny. She's actually um, a comedian and author in her own right, Alison Larkin. And she has like these little singing interludes. It's really sort of just a very warm interpretation of of Jane Austen, and she also performed with the Royal Shakespeare Company at some point. So if you have an interest in Shakespeare, she's right there with you. Um, so that's what I'm enjoying right now, and I recommend you check out some Jane Austen or, as we've mentioned before, the Shakespeare collections. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com Shakespeare. Again, that's audibletrial.com Shakespeare for your free audiobook. And thank you very much to Audible for sponsoring this podcast. So now we can go deeper. Yes, that. now we go in depth into every single detail of the play. All right, first we can talk about Palpatine. How is he Iago-like? I mean, he does not hate Anakin just like Iago does Othello. But there's some people that he hates, and those are the Jedis. Um, and Obi-Wan included, which is kind of the Othello connection there. That's true, and I was thinking about that because, I mean, that's the main difference between Yago and Palpatine, I think, that um, Yago is so jealous and angry of Othello, um, but there's no jealousy between Palpatine and Anakin. I mean, he's also jealous. He, he doesn't like Othello because he's black, mm -hmm. but Othello also appointed Cassio as his officer, mm -hmm. uh, so that's not um, helping. <laughs> that's not bringing the best light for to, for Othello. Um, he's not mm -hmm. the best person in the eyes of Iago. Um, right. so, but. Uh, I don't think Palpatine has that, but he definitely hates the Jedi because dark side and the light uh, here. Right. The two opposites. So, yeah, he might even hold against Anakin that he's a Jedi, I guess. I wanted to ask you, because I, I, I thought about this. So, if he hates the Jedi, and it's called Revenge of the Sith... Mm -hmm. I don't understand that title. Maybe I'm dumb? Maybe I... What the hell is going on? What do you mean? Like, why is it... Why is it revenge? Because I guess they're taking back over. They're building up their empire. <laughs> does, it, does it... No, but I was asking myself, does it have anything to do with Plagueis or whatever his name is? Uh, Lord, Plagueis the Wise? Lord Plagueis the Wise? Um, I don't know. Why is it called Revenge of the Sith? Um... Maybe because, I guess, the Jedi killed Count Dooku in the beginning, and then uh, General Grievous. Maybe it has to do with the first two movies, uh, with the rise of the Jedi Order, and uh, there was kind of a downfall of the Sith Order in the first two movies. So, I mean, it might be that is the revenge of the Sith. And now they're saying, no, you're not that powerful, Jedis. And... Uh, we're, we're gonna that's our revenge 
And it also seems like there's sort of the... Palpatine is sort of arguing a lot against the Jedi narrative, which is like, oh, you know, only the Sith deal in absolutes, only the Sith are bad, like only the Sith do this thing, this thing, this thing. And then it's like, aren't the Jedi doing the same thing? He seems to argue that with Anakin a couple times to sort of manipulate him, but that's also sort of like the the revenge, the turning back, you know? Yeah. And if, if I remember correctly, the first two films are also... Uh, meant to establish the Jedi order, like the powerful Jedis. The, uh, they are clearly... Uh, the, the good side is, uh, is prominent in, the, in, those two mo- in those two movies. Uh, they always win. And then in the third movie, mm, not so much. Um, it, because it's true. In the end, the, the evil wins. Um, right. Yoda goes into and, exile. And yeah, Yoda goes into exile. Obi Wan uh, rushes off to exile too. Um, Luke and Leia are also put uh, some somewhere away from the, the dark side, uh, all setting it up for the fourth movie. But it's still and uh, the good side isn't still not winning, which is, I guess, yeah. I answered my own question. Why is it revenge? Yeah, I guess we figured it out. Yeah, and then of course we know that eventually we're, we'll get to the next. But series. it's also interesting, um, revenge, because it's a prominent theme in Shakespeare. Mm-hmm. So. Well, and especially in Othello, Othello, Othello. Let's see other one. Yeah, um, Hamlet. Um, it's also mm-hmm. in a lot of plays of Shakespeare. Macbeth, Richard Macbeth, Richard III. Um, I guess uh, King Lear too, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, so revenge. So I love revenge. Did we cover uh, how? Who do you think, if he's not completely a Iago, Chancellor Palpatine, um, who do you think he is other than Iago? I mean, I think he. I think he's more a Iago than anyone else we've seen so far. Maybe except for. No, even Scar was more Richard the Third. I think he's very much a parallel of Yago, but we could also look at other rulers we've seen. Um, Is he similar to King Lear? What do you think? Like the old man, uh, like the stubborn old man. I feel like, or something like. Uh, I don't know. I a don't, grumpy old man. I don't see Lear in him. Um, because, no, I don't either. But yeah. I was. I was asking you because I don't see it. I just yeah. wanted to know if you saw it. It's interesting to think about because, you know, you would you would think that they might be similar, but he's sort of the opposite of Lear. You know, he's not willing to give up his rule. He keeps extending it. Right. And Lear is sort of saying, okay, well, it's time to divide up my home and then I'll go live with one of my daughters. Is yeah. he like uh, Richard the Third in a way? I mean... The thing about Richard is that he spends a lot of his time trying to manipulate to get into power. Which is what Palpatine does. But he's already in power, really, sort of at the beginning of the movie, right? Once he gets control of the Senate. Sure, but the Jedis are still the ruling uh, entity. They they are uh, the police. They are everything they feel to me if you're you're thinking of shakespeare they feel like the court the Mm -hmm. the the royalty and then when palpatine as palpatine's power grows and grows the jedis are no more and the 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 court has been destroyed and he takes over then right and he's sort of the supreme ruler he doesn't have that much power in the beginning but I don't know. It seemed to me like he's not powerless at the beginning. Right. Um, whereas Richard sort of spends a lot of the play trying to manipulate his way to power and then sort of loses it very quickly at the end. Right. I mean, um, he, he loses it. The Palpatine loses it very quickly at the end, too, um, in the um, episode six. But right, it's still a long yet. time to go. Um, yeah. And Richard spends a lot of time like being creepy with the widow of the former king and I don't know I just didn't see any of that with Palpatine right 
um, yeah, Richard, like, gets these kids murdered. It's sort of all about setting up, like, his future. And I guess you could look at the kids in the movie, but that's more Anakin, isn't it? Right. So maybe Anakin could be more Richard III. <sighs> the kids. Oh, my God. I forgot about that part. I feel like Anakin was such a sweet boy in the first film, and then he kills children in the third movie. And I was thinking about that today, and I was like, what the hell? <laughs> you were so sweet, and now you're killing children? How does that make sense? And then I reminded myself, oh, the writer wants us to to uh, turn on him as an audience. That's why right, he's right, killing ch children. It. Yeah. But, I mean, maybe it, it's probably because I haven't seen the first two, at least in my memory. But I was like, why does Padme like him? Right. Uh, well, you should see the, the second film and the, the first film to know why. Uh, in the first film, it's really, uh, well, she's, she, he's young. He's a kid in the, the, the first movie, and she's like 20-something or in her 16. Oh, really? Um, and he's like 7 or whatever he is. Uh, so it's kind of a big age difference. And then in the second movie, they're kind of the similar age, weirdly. <laughs> um, in this one, I would have thought she was younger, but it might just be like the Natalie Portman voice. She sounds young. Yeah. Imagine a boy with Natalie Portman of that age. That was the first movie. Wow. Yeah. So it was kind of weird, but they had a connection in the first movie, and you see the progress of their relationship. Why did, did they like each other so much in the first movie, and then why she liked him so much in the second? And then that's why you understand why they're together in the third movie. Uh, but I guess that makes it weird if you only <laughs> if you watch the, the third movie. I guess so, yeah. And then she sort of becomes that bargaining chip for him, um, like... Palpatine sort of uses his fear of her dying to manipulate him, right? Yeah. Let's talk about that. Um, I feel like, just like Iago, uh, Palpatine also likes to plan things in uh, Anakin's mind and uh, manipulate situation. Yeah, I mean, there's that great line in Othello where it's like, Othello is being wrought by Yago, right? It gives you like that image of like a statue or like a piece of metal like being changed. Right. And I think we can see that sort of with Anakin and, and Palpatine. He's being wrought. And Palpatine keeps saying, I can save your wife, Anakin. I can save your wife. Mm -hmm. And that is ultimately what stops Anakin from saving Master Windu. Right. Um, and... I don't. I, I I still don't buy it why he kills his children, but yeah, uh, it's kind of a weird and too quick reversal. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah, it was like all of a sudden, I guess to prevent there being more Jedi's. But like, come on, they're not trained enough that they would actually pose a threat. I don't argue that he's good in the beginning, Anakin. But why is being so on the Jedi side in the beginning, and then like just killing children just because he wants to save his life that he doesn't know if she's gonna die or not right even at the beginning of the film like he's ordered to kill um count doku right? yeah and he's like i shouldn't have done that it's not the jedi way and then at the end like let me kill these 20 kids it's like right thanks. but i guess it, it is also explored in the second film that he has a dark side um, and I guess it carries on in the third film, um, which Palpatine senses that he has a dark side, and that's why um, he ultimately chooses him to be his apprentice. Um, yeah. So he, just like Iago, he, Iago says to Othello, um, uh, Iago is saying to Othello, oh, I can help you. Um, I can look into um, a Cassio situation with your wife, blah, 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 uh, and I can help you figure it out. Um, and Othello is just, is just like, honest Iago, honest Iago. Um, and he thinks <laughs> Iago is his friend, just like Anakin thinks um, Palpatine is his friend. But Palpatine just wants to use him. And Iago is such a master manipulator, too. He says, you know, I shouldn't even tell you this because it's just going to make you upset. And I'm not even sure about it, so I don't even know if I should mention it. 
And then I thought, I was like, tell me, you have to tell me now. And y'all goes, well, well, if you really want me to tell you, I'm a little bit worried about Desdemona. But, you know, don't take my word for it. Like, let's get some proof. And then, of course, he creates the whole situation. Yeah. He's a storyteller, ultimately, Iago, mm-hmm. just like Palpatine is, <laughs> very much. Exactly, And yeah. you see that a lot in Shakespeare, storyteller. Yeah, I mean, and I even wonder with the visions, like, were they real visions or were they planted in his head, you know? Right. Okay, let's talk about the visions for, since you brought it up. Uh, did you think it was a little Macbethy? The prophecy, like... The, the prophecy in Macbeth yeah. and the vision, the, I guess the dreams in Star Wars. I guess that's true. I mean, yeah, it is sort of... And then you get the idea, like, if he hadn't been swayed by them, they might have never come to pass. So it's sort of the self-fulfilling prophecy that he tried to fight it and ended up causing it, you know? Uh, what's the witch prof- witch's prophecy in Macbeth? Remind me. They prophesize that um, he'll become king. Right, but after that, do, do they make a prophecy what's going on, going to happen after he becomes king? Oh yeah, then they say, oh yeah, but you're gonna get overthrown, and none of your, none of your kids, you won't have an heir, so you're not going to, you're not going to continue the line. It'll be another family. Wow, that's kind of. Do you see the connection there? Explain. So just like uh, the prophecy of the witches, which is, oh, you're going to become king, but this thing is going to happen after you're going to see a ghost, blah, 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 and everything is going to get bad after that. It's great that you're becoming a king, but it's not going to end up well for you. But Macbeth ignores it um, in the end. He just moves on, and he's selfish, and he just wants to become the king and he he and his wife overthrow the king move on with life and then he becomes mad and blah 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 uh, the chaos ensues um so just like anakin not listening to the the dreams um or Macbeth not listening to prophecy uh he anakin just moves on with life and Oh no, no, it's not. It's not fully realized. I'm worried about it, but it's still a dream. I'm not gonna let it happen. You know. I mean, yeah, I agree. But then he is sort of like consumed by this idea that it wasn't just a dream. Like he even says that a couple times, and she's like, "It's okay." But then she says to him, "I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna die." And he says, "I won't let it happen." Well, then I guess she doesn't believe it, mm-hmm. and people around him don't believe it. And Macbeth is tormented also. He doesn't want to do it uh, at mm-hmm. first. And then uh, Lady Macbeth pushes him, just well, just like Pagme, actually. I always, I don't like when people completely blame Lady Macbeth because I feel like Macbeth should still be blamed for what he did. For sure. <laughs> yeah. For sure. But do you I see agree, the, yeah, the connection? Yeah. Padme and <laughs> Lady Macbeth? It, it, it's weird they, they say just move on with life and just uh, do it whatever it is you know it's interesting because i was thinking about this and i was thinking amelia in othello is sort of a a lady macbeth figure almost at the beginning right um, amelia is iago's wife and she sort of helps him carry out the plot and at the beginning she says you know i do nothing except to please my husband i'll do whatever he asks but then we see her sort of like more as a friend to desdemona but I'm wondering, right. who does Padme have in this movie? Who is her Amelia, her companion? Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan confesses to her, and he, he becomes her friend near the end. Her <laughs> only friend, because Anakin is <laughs> kind of turning on both of them. I guess so, but does she have... I mean, I guess he sort of defends her at the end, but she doesn't have him... Like, he doesn't... He isn't her companion throughout, you know? He's... He's more like a, a Casio. Right. Me. Okay. I don't fully agree. I feel like Obi-Wan is, wants to be her friend. He wants to help her. He, he knows she's pregnant. He, he's, he isn't blind. Mm-hmm. He knows she's married to him. He isn't blind. He's being a friend to both of them. And then when Anakin starts to turn to the dark side, 
he, Obi-Wan grows closer to Padme because he's worried about Anakin. He's worried about everything. And I, I think he's the closest to Amelia uh, in this sense. That actually does make sense because it, it is mentioned that he goes over to talk to her and that's when Anakin starts getting sort of jealous, isn't it? And that's what made me think of Cassio, but it seems like he might actually be playing both roles. He might right. be Cassio and Amelia in one Yeah, character. it's not st- set in stone. Yeah. No, I'm just thinking it's really interesting that they combined those two. Like, right. It's both the the friend companion, sort of the caretaker, and the object of jealousy, the potential affair. Right. Because Obi-Wan is also Cassio, the the one uh, a fellow believes is sleeping with his wife. Um, and yeah. Anakin believes, or seems to believe, I don't know if he really believes it. Um, I was half expecting, you know, that, that little pendant she has and, he, um, and Anakin's like, oh, I remember when I gave you that and she sort of brushes it off. I was really expecting like it to happen that like Palpatine would get that stolen from her and given to Obi-Wan or something. Because yeah. it seems so much like a parallel of the handkerchief when Amelia steals right. it. And, um, but he doesn't have to. He doesn't have to. It's all words. And it's already um, planted in Anakin's mind because he's asking at the beginning of the film, oh, did Obi-Wan come here to visit you? Exactly. Oh, yes. He's checking on me. And it's already boiling mm-hmm. in Anakin's mind. He doesn't need Palpatine. And Palpatine he doesn't need a handkerchief. It's already already there, mm-hmm. which is awesome. <laughs> But I did definitely think that right. was going to happen. Yeah, George Lucas fooling me again with a red herring. But it's kind of similar in a way, too. It is, definitely. Um, okay. So, how is Anakin Skywalker a fellow? Um, yes, he, he is ma- manipulated into killing his wife. Uh, mm-hmm. Made to believe that she's having an affair with another man. His own master, Obi-Wan. Uh, just like Othello believes that Cassio is having an affair with Desdemona, but um, is he Othello? I mean, he's not black, for one. That's true. There, yeah. there's no race issue. I mean, he was a slave. Right. In the in the, the, the first and the uh, he returns in the the second movie to to save his mother from slavery. And it seems to me like in Star Wars. There's not a problem of race among the human people. Right. But it does seem like there's a lot of prejudice against people from, like, the, like, certain planets. Like, um, even in the, the, the new trilogy. What kind Rey, of prejudice? Like, race from the, the junk planet, right? And it oh, seems right. like people judge her for that. Right. Um, but she's still human. Well, yes, I don't mean she's not human. <laughs> oh, from the different pla- planets, you mean? like? Yeah, it's very much like, a, I guess, a class prejudice. Okay, I get it, right. It's almost like she's white trash, you know? <laughs> oh, okay, right. It's more about class and what, what you... Yeah, exactly. And um, Padme's royal blood, too, uh, yeah. which is funny. Um, so, I guess, because he's with her, Anakin becomes royal blood, Um or royal he's now uh, upper class so there there is right. no p- power dynamics anymore i feel like you you see that in the the first film uh though uh, episode one uh, you see the power dynamics more and doesn't that also happen in the um in the sequels too with um leia being like yeah princess the princess yeah then, but then she turns into a general later on and there's like the whole right. thing with royalty and then military and yeah yeah so it seems more of a s- power like a social thing. class yeah exactly right yeah um but in in terms of attitude and uh, uh the way othello reacts is he uh, is anakin othello i mean he is sort of renowned at the beginning of the film as like this great fighter this great um sort of military presence, you know, they're saying we should send our best. Right. And that is him. You know, he keeps telling um, Obi-Wan, like, you know, I've saved your life ten times. I've done this. And he's also the chosen one. And he's the chosen one. Yeah, right. Which is, I mean, very much a fellow. He's, like, the one that they need to send off to Cyprus. 
um, which is sort of why he's allowed to be with Desdemona because they really can't lose him at that critical right. moment when there's the incoming invasion of the Turks. Yeah. I think he's different also from Othello because mm -hmm. it's it's not so much about racism. It's not so much about... Um, it's a different story. Uh, the story uh, ultimately becomes Darth Vader, uh, which is his story in that film. How does he become Darth Vader? So it's kind of not the same story uh, as the play. So he can't, he's defined by, I guess, where he's going to end up. Um, so that makes him a different character in a way. You know, there was something that stood out to me. Um... I was actually thinking about what Deanne, our professor Deanne, said to us last year about... Deanne Williams. <laughs> Deanne Williams said to us last year about um, sort of the, the hatred with no cause, the reason all the Venetians don't like Othello. Um, because as we see, you know, he's on their side, he's fighting for them. And she mentioned that Coleridge actually had this quote that was, mode of hunting of a motiveless malignancy. So there's really no reason for them to hate him, but they have to keep finding reasons. And it actually sort of seemed to me that that is such a great summary of right. the prequels because essentially we have this character who we know is evil through and through in the sequels, but now we sort of have to go on motive hunt to find a reason for him to become evil. And that's sort of what George Lucas had to do. And to be honest, it's not the past, <laughs> like I said before. The reason he becomes evil, ultimately, the children. But. Right. But it is sort of like that. It's sort of like the opposite of the mode of hunting. Rather than like the people having right. to find reasons to hate Anakin, he has to find reasons for the audience to hate Anakin. Yeah. So exactly, yeah. Like we have to show him killing the kids because... And the wife. Otherwise, we just blah, don't blah, blah. have a reason to hate him, and now we do. Yeah. Anyway, moving on from that. We're not going to talk about that uh, anymore. Um... So, how is Padme a Desdemona? Is she anything like her? Um, maybe you can tell me what she is like in the first two films, because I'm wondering, like, is she headstrong, or is she more, like, gentle, timid? Um, no, she is... I don't know if she's timid, but she's definitely... In the first film, uh, she acts like she's a, a servant to the queen. Okay. And then we find out uh, when the queen dies, we find out that that was, um, uh, I guess, um, a doppelganger or whatever it is, uh, just to protect Pal Padme. Um, uh, and then we find out that Padme is the real queen, actually. Mm -hmm. And she was just disguised as a servant just to, to hide from, um, I guess, the, the sits and the. She was just to protect her. Okay. Uh, um, so, uh, I guess, and then she becomes, uh, she becomes in position of power and there's a reversal of power. So she's now st viewed as strong and, um, I don't know. I guess I'm just wondering about her personality because Desdemona is sort of painted with different brushes by different people. Like her right. father keeps, Brabantio keeps referring to her as like his little girl, which is so weird because, you know, you know, she's like. 17 or older she's definitely not like a 14 year old like Juliet um, and then Othello calls her a fair warrior and she actually is pretty good with speaking we see so she doesn't appear to be timid in that way but yeah the sort of the Venetian court depicts her that way at first right um but I feel in the, the third film, she is she can appear timid in a way, uh, Padme, uh, which is kind of weird because she seems so strong in the first film, and then when men uh, rise to be more powerful and the Jedi, uh, Anakin becomes a Jedi, uh, he becomes powerful, and it's now a change in dynamic. The the woman becomes passive almost. And it's weird. Like we only ever see her like hanging out in her chamber, really, except for the time she goes to the ship and she's about to go find him. Yeah. But I did like that there was a time, I think it was in like the Senate chamber, where she just like speaks her mind to the guy next to her, like without even caring. You know, she's like, "That's a bad idea. That's the end of liberty." Right. And I was like, "Yeah, say that to Anakin, please." <laughs> <laughs> so I guess, yeah, she's. 
Is she different or same? I think she's different. I mean, she's definitely a very Desdemona-like figure in in the things that happen to her, but I don't know if she's Desdemona-like in her own actions. Um, Because, I mean, Desdemona, she says, um, to my unfolding, lend your prosperous ear. She wants people to listen to her story. Exactly, and like Padme, in a way, because she doesn't... uh, Anakin doesn't believe her. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, especially when Obi Wan shows up at the the volcano planet, uh, Far whatever Musafar, whatever right. it is. I mean, I don't think she even understood what Anakin was thinking at first, and then after he started to strangle her. But she like can't defend thing. herself, just yeah. like Desdemona. Right, and I mean the fact that she gets strangled to me was like <laughs> we are getting some some hints here. <laughs> yeah, but. I mean, you could argue, did Anakin kill her? Because we see that they say there's actually nothing physically wrong with her. We see no reason that she's dying. She must have just lost the will to live. Yeah, exactly. That's what uh, that's what the, the doctors say. She she has lost the will to live. Exactly. Because probably because Anakin has turned to the dark side. Uh, but I just don't want to believe that he had that much power over her. That he still killed her. He did. I know, but... It might not be the choking, but it might be just him turning to the dark side. I was a little disappointed at the way that she died, though, you know? Yeah. I feel like she's a more powerful woman than to just give up because... I mean, she still right. had her children to live for. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But I guess if, if we're looking at Othello... I guess it it's it's along the same lines uh, right. as the way Othello kills Desdemona, um, um, and she, she dies because she she Othello has gone completely that's turned to the dark side. Blah blah blah. Um, Another interesting thing is like the breakdown of Othello's speech towards the end. Like we were talking about, um, he starts using like lots of exclamation points right. and dashes and like his speech becomes so frenzied and we see Anakin talking that way towards the end he's like oh we're gonna we're gonna rule together we're gonna have this empire and she just starts slowly backing away and she's you know clearly there is some right. breakdown of your thoughts going on here yeah and she sort of recognizes the way that Desdemona does I think just a little bit too late that Othello slash Anakin is not Quite who he was before. <laughs> okay, so Othello kills himself. He stabs himself uh, at the end of the play when he realizes what he's done. But you could also argue that in Star Wars, The Revenge of the Sith, Anakin kills himself um, by doing by turning to the dark side and mm-hmm. by killing Padme and blah, blah, blah. And then he becomes a totally different person, Darth Vader. Uh, but that's also another similarity if we're thinking about Othello killing himself, Anakin killing himself, uh, in a way. That's kind of similar, too, if yeah, we're tying sure. it up to change. Othello. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, I mean, and there's sort of that scene where Obi-Wan says, um, you know, it's over, Anakin, I have the high ground. And then he says, right. he sees... He kills himself in that way, too. Yeah, he sees... Anakin about to jump and he says Anakin don't do it and Anakin does it anyway yeah he kills himself in that way so yeah, yeah he gets his legs chopped off right. and he burns and it's I mean it was sort of like a suicidal act to jump at him yeah okay so that ties to, to the the ultimate end of Othello uh, too um, Othello does turn on Iago at the end of the play mm-hmm. um and find out finds out that Iago has been doing all of that. Right, he made all of it happen. So it doesn't happen in this movie, in this Star Wars movie, but in the final, in the sixth one, episode six, Darth Vader does turn on Palpatine at the end, mm. uh, and uh, because of Luke and uh, who is uh, Darth Vader's son, um, and. He does, just like a fellow turns on Iago, turn on Palpatine, and ultimately uh, Darth Vader kills Palpatine. Hmm, uh, interesting. Which is interesting when thinking about the play. Right, because Iago isn't killed. He's no. just taken to serve his time in prison, right? Right. He's sort of put at the mercy of the 
the greater sense of justice. Right. But I feel like it's kind of Othello's redemption story at the end, or a redemption act when he sees uh, what he's done. He, it goes back for a split second to the good side. Uh, mm. Just like Anakin uh, goes back to the good side at the end of episode six. Right, they sort of have that moment. Right, that moment of realization of what they did. Um, but yeah, that's kind of similar in a way. And then Darth Vader dies, right? Yeah. So same thing, yeah. With Othello. Othello kills himself. Othello yeah. kills himself and dies too. Yeah, so anything else um, about Othello that you see? Othello is very much a play with a lot of sort of geography and right. like the idea of the different cultures in sort of the meeting spots of civilization. And that is true in Star Wars too. Yeah, it's the Jedi and the Sith, right? Right. And it's sort of this this planet is the meeting place of like all these different races too. Yeah, but uh, yeah, the not just the 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 Sith and the Jedi's, but also all the different plan planets and right. We uh, see like the, the worlds, yeah. yeah. Um, and the, the lava world, and we see the, the grievous world, and we see uh, everything like that. Yeah, so I think it's interesting to think about... I mean, we do hear the Jedi described as a religion. It's not just, you know, a magic force. It's like this way of living, this ultimate belief system. And I think in that way you can compare it to sort of the underlying story in, in Othello, which is sort of the... The Turkish people versus the Catholic the nations. That's interesting. Great. Another interesting thing is that um, sort of the very basic frame of Othello is sort of we start with a very domestic conflict, which is right. the daughter and her father and her suitor, mm -hmm. and then we move out to this huge global sort That's of. That's very conflict. Midsummer Night's Dream too. Yes, but then we move out to sort of the, the Turks versus the Venetians, and then we move back in, mm -hmm. sort of once that threat of the impending invasion, the impending war is over, back to this very domestic conflict. Yeah. And it ends in a bedroom. And it's sort of the same thing in the film, I think, because we sort of start off with, you know, like these tender scenes between Anakin and Padme. Maybe not in the first scene, but then it sort of moves out to the general, you know, they keep talking about, like, when the war is over, this great impending fight, even though we do see scenes of it, not like in Othello. Right. But at the end, we do move back to the very domestic. We move back to the birth of the two children and them being raised in their new homes. So it's sort of the same general structure, if you know what I mean. It's also not uh, about the war in terms of... because. It's really about friendship too. It's about mm -hmm. Obi Wan and Anakin's friendship and trust and being destroyed. So it's kind of um, uh, a, a contained story in a, in this big world, uh, mm -hmm. which is interesting uh, when thinking about Shakespeare, uh, because as you said, it's very uh, Shakespeare often presents big worlds. But it's often contains story. Uh, it's also often about marriages. It's often about two people fighting each other. It's not about oh, we're gonna fight this war, uh, blah blah right. blah, uh, which is interesting. It's very much yeah, like a two-person conflict. Yeah, um, and that's what dialogues are—a <laughs> two-person conflict. Exactly, and I feel like one of the most interesting scenes to me is the one where Desdemona goes to Anakin and Desdemona goes to Anakin <laughs> <laughs> the one where Padme goes to Anakin they're just so similar I mix them up and oh there are now <laughs> <laughs> they are um, and he lies to her and says oh you know nothing's the matter and she says when are we going to stop lying to each other right and I feel like oh, why couldn't Desdemona have said that you know she doesn't get that chance to speak for herself. You know, if if she got the chance to say that to Othello, maybe things would have been different. I don't know. That scene just stood out to me because she does sort of take it into her own hands. So it's kind of a redemption story for um, Desdemona yeah. in that sense. This is the modern, the modern Desdemona. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. Even though the ending doesn't really turn out differently for her, but at least she gets to have kids. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so with the little time we have left, um, I, I just wanted to highlight some Shakespeare themes that were uh, that I saw in this film, Forbidden Marriages, uh, which is what Padme talks about a, a lot uh, in the second film. Uh, that's a prevalent theme because an important theme uh, because they run away they do run away to get married um, and in the court world they are forbidden so that's really Shakespeare uh, we have exiles there are often talks of exile Yoda wants to exile himself blah 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 just like in King Lear gets exiled um, and there are plenty of exiles in uh, Shakespeare. Um, revenge, as we mentioned, Hamlet. And then uh, disguises, people hiding their true identities. Uh, Palpatine is one. Uh, he hides as the counselor, but he's in fact the, the Sith Lord. Right, Darth yeah. Sidious. Yeah. yeah. Anybody hiding in disguise? Mm. The clones. The clones? Yeah, they work for Palpatine oh, in the end. That's true. Yeah, um, because probably because he paid them much more. Um, but um, one thing that interested me the most was General Grievous and Count Dooku as servants. We've talked about this before. Uh, servants um, in the Winter's Tale, uh, Camillo is one. Uh, we talked about who else is a servant. I mean, there's even Rodrigo in Botten. this one. Is Rodrigo no, is Botten. a servant to Yago. Yeah, Puck is a is a servant. Ariel. Ariel oh, Caliban. So yeah, um, General Grievous and Count Dooku as servant doesn't matter if they die; they serve a purpose. Um, the clones are also servant in a way, which is very Shakespeare. Um, yeah. Anything to say about that? Is Anakin a servant in a way? Um, I mean, I guess in a way because, you know, he gets put on the council sort of to be Palpatine's sort of eye on the council. And then he doesn't get to be a master. And then they ask him to spy on Palpatine. So he's sort of being asked to be a double agent for both sides. So in that way, he's sort of a servant of this greater conflict going on. He's a servant of the dark side of the force. Exactly. Yeah. So that's what I saw, the power dynamics. Uh, the Cord versus the green world. Can we talk about that for two seconds? Mm -hmm. What is the green world? I feel like it's more present in the, in the second episode when um, you, you, could re you can really see Padme uh, decide to run away and uh, get married to Anakin. Uh, she gets away from the court world and goes to the green world to do it, which is very uh, Shakespeare-like. Um, but is there a green world in this film? I mean, we do get the callback. Padme actually says at one point, like, oh, I wish it was, like, when we were by the lake and, you know, none of this mattered. It was just the two of us. Right. And it is sort of that absence of all the social norms and all the um, conflicts that they don't have to be a part of because they're in society. Um, but I don't know if there's... Do you think there's a green world in this film? Well, I guess in the end, uh, when Obi-Wan exiles himself to the green world, he gets away from the, the court life. The, right, and Yoda, too. Yoda, too. Um, Yoda goes into his little marsh. Even Dark Sidious gets away from the, uh, the, the, the main city that we see. Uh, he, he wants to run away to the green world. Oh, I don't know. Can Darth Sidious get away from the court? Because, as we know, he is the Senate. <laughs> yeah, you're right, actually. And Anakin sort of loses the ability to get into the green world because he ends up being sort of mm -hmm. completely right. man-made. But I guess mm, where I saw Dark Sidious getting away was, like, because we always see this main city where the Jedi Temple is. So I, I guess that was the court in my mind no I agree but yeah. I guess Dark Sidious in the end ends up uh, like the image of him in the ship it's like oh I'm gonna control the world now uh, so I, I don't I don't know him, if yeah. he gets away from the court no you think he takes it with him right he, because then the whole 
he has the whole empire, you know, it's no longer just the one planet he's in control of, it's everything. And that scene, <laughs> that scene especially when he, he, he just goes in, into the court uh, before the fight with Yoda uh, and just says, Oh, the Jedi have betrayed us! Blah, blah, blah. Uh, I can't do a Paladin impression. But, I don't uh, think I can either. The Jedi have Power. betrayed us! Power! <laughs> the Jedi have betrayed us! <laughs> Anyway, so he does, that moment is very court-like, so I don't know if he fully gets away from the court. Yeah, I don't think he does. Anyway. um, Do it! (laughs) (laughs) Do it, Anakin! Oh my god, I'm never going to get over this movie. Uh, That was a, (laughs) that was a fun movie to watch. (laughs) I, I was sitting there. I, I'm going to be honest with the audience right now. I was sitting there and I was like, do we really have to cover Star Wars right now? I, I don't mind the other movie. The The original trilogy is fine. But do we really have to cover Revenge of the Sith right now? Do I really have to watch this movie? Because it's so bad. No. Yeah, we picked this movie. We we put that on ourselves. Uh, uh, we, we, we decided to do that. But when I sat down... And started watching Star Wars Revenge of the Sith, I realized, oh my god, I'm in for, for how, how long is this? Like <laughs> two, two, and a half hour, hours. two and a half hours? I was like, oh no, oh no. See, I really enjoyed it because of all the, the jokes I was learning about. <laughs> yeah, but it was your first time too. Exactly. I think I watched it too many times. I was like, do I really have to watch this again? Especially with my adult mind now that I see all the problems. I'm oh, like, yeah. no, no, no. I didn't enjoy it as a film, but I wasn't bored by it because it was funny. No, I wasn't bored, but, uh, but I guess it was interesting. What made it interesting ultimately is looking for Shakespeare. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, I was in the beginning, I was just not up for it. Uh, I, and... In its defense, the movie got better as it progressed. Um, yeah, I didn't like the beginning scenes. Yeah. They were like... Yeah, especially the fight fighting. scene in the beginning. Yeah, which you just get thrown into the fight with no warning. Well, there is a warning. Oh, with George... Is. Yeah, the message at the beginning. There's that, and then you get like instantly like people shooting at each other. Well, that's Star Wars. Welcome well, to Star Wars. <laughs> I've seen the other movies, and none of them were like that. Except the most. They all started in space. They all started in space. I I guess this movie starts in a fight in space, though. I'm not saying they can't start in space, but this instantly, like, you don't even know who's fighting. Yeah. I mean, I guess if you're a Star Wars fan, you know who's fighting. But if you don't, if you haven't seen right, right, I I, I get what you mean. Yeah. Anyway, so I hope you like this podcast. If you don't like Star Wars or the Revenge of the Sith, I don't blame you for not listening. But you can also find Shakespeare in other Star Wars movies, I think. I mean, I was even thinking about Rose and <laughs> we Finn. We haven't scratched the surface. Rose uh, and for, Finn, right? Yeah, like, yeah, we haven't scratched the surface for Star Wars. We'll be back with it. Uh, I saw something for episode two. I saw something for episode four. I saw something for the new uh, trilogy. No, uh, I think we'll just go one movie at a time for this because there's so much. Uh, uh, to talk about. Uh, I think George Lucas has a, a great uh, Shakespeare understanding, and I think the new filmmakers have too. Um, and I think that's going to be interesting in the the other movies to talk about. Uh, I don't think it's all Othello. No, it's <laughs> not, not at all. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's going to be interesting. So if you'd like us to do more Star Wars, please let us know at how to get away with Shakespeare at gmail.com. And on Twitter, H-T-G-A-W-S underscore podcast, or Jane the Fox, or Gabriel Vega. No, Vega Gabe. <laughs> add Vega Gabe. Add Vega Gabe. <laughs> Don't add Gabriel Vega. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and you can reach us on Instagram, um, How to Get Away with Shakespeare, Facebook, How to Get Away with Shakespeare. Um, but yeah, let us know what you think. Subscribe, rate, review our podcast on iTunes. Um Tell us if you think Obi-Wan is Cassio or Amelia or both. Let us know your thoughts and opinions. So what's the quote this week, Jane? So it's from Iago, and he's sort of saying as 
uh, little mini soliloquy to himself he's meditating on. He's just realized that he can use the power of jealousy right. against Othello. He's just realized like how much like a drug it is almost, like how much power it has. So he's about to start using that against Othello. And how does it relate to Star Wars, I might ask? I mean, I mean we see jealousy used against Anakin um, in terms of Obi-Wan Kenobi. Right. So it's sort of a direct parallel there. Here's the quote. The more already changes with my poison. Dangerous conceits are in their nature's poisons, which at the first are scarce found to distaste, but with a little act upon the blood burn like the mines of sulfur. I did say so. Look where he comes. Not poppy nor mandragora, nor all the drowsy syrups of the world shall ever medicine thee to that sweet sleep which thou owest yesterday. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. If you liked this podcast and want more, go on iTunes and search for How to Get Away with Shakespeare. We're also on SoundCloud, Spreaker.com, and YouTube. Again, thank you very much for listening.